From the start of Earth's existence, life evolved with chaos and disaster. Surviving deep underground to return to the oceans once again. Life endured ice, then prospered when finally oxygen became abundant. From microbes to the first complex creatures, life was always searching for new frontiers on a miracle planet. Four hundred and fifty million years ago, the Earth had become a less violent planet. It was no longer being bombarded by giant meteors from space. The great ice ages had passed. Nothing yet lived on the land, but in the warm and shallow seas which fringed the continents, there was a rich diversity of life. Fish had not yet evolved jaws, so these arendapsis, the distant ancestors of terrestrial life. Remained close to the coast where they could feed. Segmented creatures, the trilobites had diversified into many species. Just beneath the surface, the mantle is made up from molten rock, which moves slowly with the force of gravity. The movement is both circular as well as vertical. This convection. Drives the restless drifting of the continents. Land masses collide. But the waters move elsewhere, and so new environments are born. Continents move very slowly, but over millions of years, the changes are dramatic. But not only were the continents being forced to change, life was also modifying its shape. An arms race had begun. In the French National Museum of Natural History, Dr. Daniel Gouget has studied this period of prehistory and the armored and predatory fish that had evolved. 410 million years ago, giant predators were hunting the oceans. These creatures had developed a new and mighty weapon: the jaw. With the invention of the jaw, you get to a new possibility for the animal. To become a predator, they have a unique skeletal structure that does not exist in any fish today. The front part of its body was shielded in hard, armor-like bones. Instead of teeth, they had bony plates in their mouths, which acted like a pair of razor-sharp scissors. With strong jaws, the placoderms dominated the seas of the Devonian period. They were like armored sharks. Our early ancestors had no chance against predators like these. 
the Ostatians were there, but they were absolutely uh, under the dominance of these placodons, which were adapted to all kinds of environment. They represent about uh, 75 to 80 percent of the vertebrates you find in the Devonian. So our uh, Ostatian ancestors were certainly in the shadow of the placoderms because they couldn't develop. Over millions of years, the jawless fish, Arandaspis, had become extinct. But one of the fish that had evolved was this, called Euthanopteron. Science knows it as one of the lobed finned fishes. And this one was the stepping stone to the creatures which would eventually come to walk on land. It was a good swimmer, but could not compete with the placoderms. So it had to seek alternatives. Life was now becoming a series of strategies, both for predator and prey. Strategies that were sometimes dictated by the Earth itself. The clues are in the rocks and the history of the continents as they shift. The fossil record now is widely scattered, but when we move back in time, the sites move together to where the creatures once lived. The interior of this continent was empty, a dry desert with no life. When the continents clashed, the force threw up a great mountain range. We know it as the Caledonian Mountains. The northernmost site of those ancient mountains are in Norway, here at Sonjefjord. The folds and curves in the rocks can only hint at the forces which are at work in the earth. At the point of collision, solid rock can bend and twist as the massive forces at work blend one vast landmass with the next. When the ancient continents of Baltica and Laurentia met, they shaped the hard rocks as if they were putty in the hands of a potter. This sinuous rock formation is known by geologists as a fold. Here is another part of those vanished mountains at Monreith Bay in Scotland. 430 million years ago, these twisted and tortured rocks, folding over and upon each other, were also part of the shoreline of the Aaptis Sea. The southern tip of the collision is in the east of the United States. This too was once a part of the Caledonian Range. The strata folds its way for thousands of miles from the USA to Norway. But of greater interest to prehistorians is what happened when the Caledonian Mountains were forced up, when the ancient Iaptis Sea was drained and the rich diversity of life it sheltered was abruptly forced to seek alternatives. The Earth may seem a permanent place, but it is restless and responsive to the forces that surge beneath its surface. The formation of continents, seas, and mountain ranges take millions of years, but the power is awesome. Mountains were forced up for over 40 million years. Geologists believe that some of the peaks were almost as high as Mount Everest. 
But what is intriguing is that many fossils of those creatures which were our early ancestors are found where the foothills of the Caledonian Range once stood. The moisture-laden winds are halted by the peaks. They rise and cool, then rain falls in torrents. Parts of the sea were moved inland, they became rivers, and then where the country flattened, the water spread out to become freshwater lakes. New environments were created, new frontiers to challenge life. Some plant life had evolved, but its grip on the land was tenuous. Often the land was bone dry, and when it rained, the force of the rushing water would erode the soil, taking with it the mosses and ferns which struggled to grow. The lakes, when they were tranquil, must have been inviting environments, just out of reach. But life itself took a part in the opening up of these new freshwater habitats. The rock face alongside this river was once the edge of an ancient freshwater lake. 370 million years ago, this was at the foothills of the ancient Caledonian Range. Today, it's called Red Hill in the state of Pennsylvania. This was the site of one of the earliest known forests. These leaves are from the earliest known trees on the planet which spread their branches and changed the world. tree is called Archaeopteris. Scientists think that it was not unlike today's conifers, the pines and larches with thin needle-like leaves. They had roots which spread wide and deep and would help bind the soil when the floods came. Like today's trees, the trunk thickened with every year of growth and scientists believe that it may have grown as tall as 20 meters, just over 60 feet. What it gave to life was shelter from the sun. Dr. Stephen Sheckler has studied the impact that Archaeopteris had, both upon the environment and the life that was in lakes and swamps. This is a good-sized Archaeopteris stump. Uh -huh. It's uh, the kind that's pretty typical for the trees of this time. Yeah, that'd be 25 centimeters. 25 centimeters, okay. Yeah. So, that's another big one. Then we've got some small ones here. Exactly, yeah. Should I slide back to here now? Yeah, that's a good idea. By marking the fossil stumps, he and his students can then work out how dense this ancient forest may have been. This young forest behind us, I think, is actually a very close analog to the appearance of what the first Archaeopteris forest would have looked like. Trees with white bark that are bare now would have been about the size of the early Archaeopteris. So the whole ecosystem was transformed by the introduction of Archaeopteris. What previously had been an open environment with relatively low primary productivity became a closed canopy environment with much higher rate of productivity. This was the first forest canopy to provide shade and shelter. These trees spread their pine-like needles 